So tonight's topic is uh, to do with uh, scalability of applications. And there's a subtitle about why there's no giant, so I'm going to try to explain all that to you. Um, how many people here uh, consider themselves to be involved with performance analysis of any kind? Performance engineering? Okay, so it's quite a few. Okay. I'm not going to assume anybody knows too much about performance analysis because um, uh, I'm going to show you something about performance analysis that not probably most of you don't see. So what I'm not going to be talking about is things like monitoring computer systems, which a lot of people are involved with and understand a lot better than me probably. I'm going to be talking about debugging code or performance testing or load testing, which a lot of people also do. Uh, but what I am going to be talking about is essentially all of those things, but combined with a few other things that you might not have seen so much before. And that is basically to do with performance modeling, a term you may have heard before, but you may not have actually seen it uh, being used. So that's what I'm going to show you. So uh, part of the um, skill of real performance analysis is actually figuring out how much information to throw away and how much information to include. This is anathema for a lot of people, particularly uh, people who do application development, because they tend to worry a lot about details. The reason is because they're developing features, so-called, for their applications. And so they do have to worry about details. When it comes to things like performance modeling, it's almost the opposite that's important. And that's the way that you try to approach quantifying things like application scalability, which is what I'm going to be talking about. And to look at it from another point of view, uh, this is a little bit like data analytics for anybody who's involved with that, which seems like everybody's doing that these days. Um, but here it's going to be applied to computer efficiency or computer performance. The other main point is that data is only half the story. I mean half in a, a rhetorical sense. And the other half really requires having a modeling framework. Otherwise, how the hell are you going to know if you're wrong? You can't tell that just looking at data. So the other thing is my word and motto that I have is trust nothing and verify. So just before I take off there, you've already uh, had the announcements and some of you have received a couple of books. So I've read a few books, I've read a few papers that was mentioned earlier. I also run some performance classes, uh, sometimes here locally in uh, Pleasanton, typically. And as you can see, performance analysis is a very serious business. We take it very seriously. And uh, you're welcome to come to those classes if, uh, if you're interested in what I'm talking about tonight. So first let me talk about the subtitle, which is to do with uh, giants. The reason for that is because uh, trying to understand why there are no real giants, at least not in the uh, fairy tale sense, is to do with uh, understanding how uh, load affects systems. So is, I'm not sure about Jack and the Beanstalk. Is everybody here familiar with Jack and the Beanstalk? And that's a, yeah, okay. Sometimes these are British fairy tales that don't make it across the pond. So anyway, the basic idea there, of course, is apart from the story is that Jack has to climb this giant beanstalk, which goes up through the clouds and God knows what, it's going to be five or 10,000 feet. I won't even bother talking about that. But the idea is, of course, the, uh, the adversary is the giant, who by some accounts is something like 30 feet tall. And if we look at that from a uh, physics point of view, it turns out that having somebody 30 feet tall is extremely unlikely. And the reason for this was known actually to Galileo. Back in 1638, he published a book on so-called two new sciences. The two new sciences, by the way, were what we would today call material science and kinematics. Kinematics means understanding motion without understanding the force producing it. Understanding the force took another, another 50 or 100 years until Newton arrived. All right, so uh, this business of uh, uh, why there are no giants was really, in some sense, known to Galileo. But as I said, he, he published his book in 1638, and uh, he understood that the, there was a connection between the amount of uh, load that a system could handle and um, the structure of the system to try to bear that load. And one easy way to understand this is look at that middle diagram I have here. Um, imagine the column is actually a rope with a, a number of strands inside the rope. Obviously, if you hang a heavier weight on that rope, you need to have more strands to take that additional force. So it should be clear then that the amount of weight that you can sustain 
uh, is proportional in some sense to the diameter of that rod or its cross-sectional area. And that's one of the things that Galileo discovered. So here is the tallest recorded human, according to Google. And he made it to about nine feet. And uh, here's a picture of him with dear old dad, who was about six feet. And what you can't see here is under, under, the, uh, under his trousers here, he has leg braces. So he died when he was 22. I imagine that probably gives a heart failure. He must have had quite a massive pump, pump blower in that system. Anyway, we can formalize that by looking at a couple of curves, one of which goes like the volume, and one of which goes like the cross-sectional area. And I've represented it here so you can see in the middle, the two curves cross. And that point is a critical point, so that anything, any load that is greater than that critical point will cause collapse. So that's how it works out. Things break. And what I'm going to do is use a similar idea to understand software scalability. Uh, we won't necessarily be looking at a critical point because I'm not looking at the failure of systems, I'm looking at the performance of application software. So we'll look at performance deterioration and not actually performance uh, breakage of any kind. Okay, so this is going to involve a little bit of math and so on, so go on up, real science ahead. So in order to get a handle on uh, how to assess scalability, we need to understand some of the fundamental properties. Now this isn't too hard if you think about it, because one of the first scaling properties that everybody would like to have, that everybody wants, is linear scaling. If I add more applications or more users or more load on the system, if I provide more resources in a linear fashion, then I can just keep doing that more or less forever at least until I fill the room or some other finite limit. So this is what everybody wants. This is usually what you get. That's to say that the scaling curve in red falls away from linear. And so there's some kind of diminishing returns. You can think about why. I'll explain more about that in a minute. Everybody hates this. Not only do you fall away from linear, there can actually be a ceiling which you can't go above. And that ceiling may not have to do with room, but maybe to do with it system of the application itself. And then finally, the other major property is retrograde throughput, and everybody thinks this never happens, but I'm going to show you quite a few examples where this is obviously happening. So these three, the, these four components are the, are the major aspects that I'd like to be able to encapsulate when I'm assessing performance and particular scalability. So I need a way to do that. And some years ago, I developed a, an approach to doing that, which involved just a single equation which contains all this information. So let me define some of the symbols I'm going to use. They're not too difficult to understand. So N is going to represent the number of processes that are providing stimulus or load onto the system. And I want to know, how does this thing scale according to that load? If I make N bigger, how does it respond? So this response function is of something I'll call the relative capacity. And that's a function of some kind. The question is, what kind of function is it? Well, it turns out to be something called like a rational function, which you don't need to understand. But this is what it looks like. So you can see the blue, the pink, and the green sections. They contain the features I was just discussing a minute ago. So I like to call this the three Cs, the three components of the three Cs. Then they are concur concurrency. And unfortunately, that's probably for the wrong thing. But anyway, concurrency. Uh, contention, which is this pink oval here, and coherency, which is the green box that you see there. So the point is, with all those terms included, I've actually kept the plots I just showed you a minute ago that were schematic, they're now contained in this equation. And the major part of the information in this equation contained in the three coefficients, gamma, alpha, and beta. So I'd like a way of assessing what they are. So here's the main idea that most people are not aware of. So you're well aware of collecting measurements, collecting data. In this particular case, most of the, this talk is going to be about throughput. And I like to define throughput using the symbol x, just, just the way I, uh, that's what you'll see in my books also. Um, so if I take that throughput data, that's to say x is some low value n, I want to understand how is that thing scaling then I need to relate that to something called the scalability metric, that's to say this relative capacity. Well, that's just the ratio of whatever the throughput is for some low n relative to what it was for some single instance of the load, x of 1. I'm just normalizing the data, actually. 
So that's what you would do if you were just working with the data. That's one way of looking at it. You could plot that, you could try to analyze that and so on. The magic is that I'm asserting that that data, that scalability metric, which you actually define through the data that you collected, I'm asserting that that data should conform to the equation that I just showed you. That's that rational function, which contains these three coefficients alpha, beta, gamma. And when you do that, then you see things like this. So this is now a plot of some of the possible shapes that this uh, universal scalability neural model can take. So it could, it could accommodate linear scalability. It could accommodate falling away from linear because of diminishing uh, returns. And it could also cover various kinds of retrograde throughput, as you saw earlier. So now these are, these are curves that I've generated from this equation. So this is just, I've just chosen some examples to show that. Uh, relatively speaking. So the next piece of, uh, uh, that, that I need to look at is how to determine these coefficients themselves. So there are many different ways of going about this, but the two primary ways are that I can get my throughput measurements at various process lows, maybe from a load testing platform, so people doing performance engineering, that's typically what they do. I could use that data, in fact that's actually quite straightforward to use that data. Because all I need is your throughput values. And the load measurement tools already automatically collect that and uh, calculate that number for us. The other possibility is to use production data to say a system is actually running live. You can do that too. And then uh, once I've got those data, I can then try to get that to conform to this model by adjusting the values of the coefficients alpha, beta, and gamma. Now you can try to do that by brute force. A bit silly, actually. Uh, or you could try and do it in a clever way. In a clever way, you could do something like uh, nonlinear regression statistical techniques, or some kind of an optimizer and so on. Even though it work. I'm going to focus on regression tonight. Now, I was expecting there might be quite a few people here tonight who are, who, who does just regard themselves as data scientists here tonight? I know who the guilty parties are, so you need to put your hands up. Like you, put your hand up. Yeah. So that a lot of people who do data science, of course, talk about being all about statistics because everybody's a data scientist now. However, let me just remind you what regression is and how it works in three or four slides. So I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but NASA has a spacecraft called Dawn, which is now currently orbiting uh, what's known as a dwarf planet. Uh, called Ceres, which is out near the asteroid belt, actually. And uh, it's only in the last month or so this uh, this actual uh, spacecraft has gone dark now. It's 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 actually finished its mission, so there's no problem that it's gone dark. Sometimes certain things like the Voyager is still chugging along 40 years after launch, and so they get it to do other things that are not going to happen with, with the dawn, unfortunately. So it's now gone dark. But the idea was to go and examine this uh, dwarf planet called Ceres up close and personal. So now it's a matter of looking at all that data that's been retrieved and NASA's going to do its thing with that. Why do I bring this up? What's this got to do with regression? This has a lot to do with regression. Because 200 years ago, Ceres was first observed through, through telescopes at that time. And it was a new object that thought actually to be a full planet, a full bona fide planet at that time. And so some astronomers had plotted parts of its orbit as it was getting near the sun. And then it went behind the sun. And now the problem is, is that thing coming back? Is it coming around the other side of the sun, or is it just going to be a slingshot out of the, out of the solar system? Well, it turned out that it's orbiting, as we now know. And that question was a burning question at the time. And it turns out that the very famous mathematician, uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss, accurately uh, estimated the then unknown orbit of Ceres in 1801. And the way he did that was, there's lots of tricks, and I've actually looked at his paper, and it's incredibly complicated to uh, understand what he did. He used many, many tricks. But one of the tricks that he used was what you would today call least squares regression. Why did he use that? He used it because he invented it, number one, he invented the number two when he was 18 years old, just in case you're thinking of taking them on. So he was able to use that, and uh, if you go and read uh, Gauss's paper, you won't understand exactly what he's doing. But the basic trick is, 
that everybody at the time, all the astronomers at the time, thought you didn't have enough data because the astronomers observed Ceres just before it went behind the sun, and then it was unobservable. So there was only about, I don't know, I think about 20 data points all told, some of which weren't particularly good. And the idea at the time was, well, we need more data before we can do any kind of predictions. Big data. Gauss showed them that that's wrong. You don't need big data. What you need is regression, and you need to know Kepler's laws. If you know Kepler's laws for the orbits of planets, plus statistical regression, which he invented, then you can predict where the path is, and that's what he did more accurately than anybody else. So statistical regression plus a little data. And of course, the, the Gaussian distribution of errors that you may be familiar with, that all comes from this you know, in 1801. And he blew everybody out off, off the planet, and uh, he was set for life after that. So let's look at what, what Gauss invented, just to remind ourselves what regression is in a couple of slides. So imagine I have some data. Here's some data showing black dots. And I would like to make some predictions about what's going on here. So it turns out the x-axis is some restaurants that have been visited. Maybe I visited them, maybe we all visit them. But there's about half a dozen data points here. And the restaurants are shown on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the tip amount that was left for those particular meals at those restaurants. Now, with that data, all you do in terms of making a prediction would be to take the average of all of those data points and say, well, I don't know where it is, but it's somewhere around that average value, which is shown here as the red line. That's the best you can do. You could also take into account the deviation of the, of the data points above and below that average value. If we do that, then I've represented those as vertical arrows, some of which point above, upward from the, uh, from the mean uh, line in red, and some of which point below. So we have both positive arrows and negative arrows. This could be a problem because if we wanted to understand something about the deviation around the mean, and I just add the length of the arrows together, a lot of them may cancel out, which will leave me with zero, which is not going to give me particularly useful information about predictions. So to get around that, what they do is they square the length of those arrows. And when you do that, then all the numbers become positive. And now if I add them up, I have some kind of metric, which is going to, if the deviation become big, that number of based on adding the squares together will also become big, so it's some kind of figure of merit of deviation. Now, I might like to try and do a bit better than that and see if the tip amounts are correlated with anything else that I know about, such as the bill. The tip amount might well be related to the bill. That seems like a reasonable kind of a guess. But now I've changed the scenario because I'm now comparing two random variables in statistical language. And the tips are shown as one random variable on the y-axis, and now the x-axis is no longer just the restaurants. This is now the tip amount at each restaurant. So I've now got two random variables, and I'm comparing them. And the way you do that is I now need to produce a new mean, which is the blue line that you see here. And that point where they cross there is called the centroid, by the way. So it goes through the origin and through the centroid. Now, I can do the same procedure I just did a minute ago with the mean which is to take the vertical deviation from the blue line now and then take their respective squares so that I keep all the numbers positive. And I would like to make this deviation as small as possible because this represents in some sense a kind of error relative to the prediction based on the mean. If I combine these two plots together now, you can see that the original tip error is the, shown, uh, is the amount shown in the red and the model error is, that's to say, the yellow squares from comparing the two random variables, the tip and the bill, uh, is, is the yellow area. And you can see that, roughly speaking, the uh, uh, relative proportion is about 75%. In other words, the, the remaining error is about 25%. The way a statistician would say this is that 75% of the variation around the mean when comparing the two random variables is about 75% of that variation is explained by this model. The model being that straight line. The linear, that's the linear least squares. The line is that line, and the least squares are these squares which represent the squares from the vertical deviations. So, that's it. That's what regression is. That's how it works. We're going to go up one notch higher because I'm going to be in non-linear regression. So I've got to cover all these uh, curves that I showed you earlier. And then I could also include things like confidence bands, so I'm not going to worry about that tonight. But they can all be done. So let's look at some real examples now. So this is uh, 
some data that was provided to me uh, to do with uh, an application called Vanish, which is essentially an HTTP accelerator. And the idea is that uh, it caches requests, HTTP gets and so forth to improve performance and scalability. And the claim basically is that this thing is highly scalable, meaning really linear. And remember what I said before, you know, uh, down everything and then verify. So when I see a claim like that, it's like, oh yeah, let's take a look at that thing with the USL. Let's do that. So here's the data that provided to me. Now this data is actually coming from a low test rig, so that's, uh, that's how these data, these data were collected, not production system. And this plot just shows those data uh, on a graph where I've got the load generators N on the x-axis. That's typically how I'm going to be looking at these data now. And on the y-axis, I show my relative capacity, C of N, which is that equation that I told you about earlier. Now, look, looking at that data, it looks pretty linear. But don't be deceived. So now I'm plotting this against a real one-to-one -one linear ratio. And you can see, well, yes, it's linear, but it's not growing one-to-one, -one, but it's pretty damn close. It's not bad, out to 400 generators. But that actually is quite impressive. But I can now fit that to the USL. When I do that, the uh, uh, procedure that I do in R will tell me automatically the values of alpha, beta, and gamma. And there you are, you're sitting in the box there. So I won't go into explaining what all these values mean, but this says actually alpha is fairly small. So that would explain why this looks linear. The beta value, which is really responsible for the retrograde behavior, isn't really there because it's essentially zero for all practical purposes. So that's consistent, and the gamma value corresponds to how the rate at which it rises in a linear fashion. So that looks actually quite reasonable, but could it really continue to do that, or would it hit some kind of a ceiling? Well, I've just taken this out now. On the order of magnitude more, this is out to about 5,000 node generators. Now, this is not measurements. This is projections based on the data. So you see the data is down these little black dots down the lower left-hand side. But there's nothing preventing me from taking the fitted data done with this non-linear regression and extrapolating. That's the whole point, actually. The, the, the idea is not to fit the data points. The idea is to see what the data is not telling me. And what it's not telling me here is nothing exceptional, actually. It says, yes, well, it's, it's gradually falling away from linear. But the rate is extremely small, which to me is impressive. So I'm, I'm, even though I'm a skeptic, I'm saying, yes, well, that guy who claims that, that uh, Barnish scales linearly is actually not wrong. I would say, I, in a quantitative fashion, he's pretty correct. It's quite, quite impressive, actually. It's not typical. So the main point here is I'm looking beyond the data. I'm not just trying to fit the data. A lot of people think that fitting the data in regression is the main game. That's not the main game. That's the start of the game. Once you've fitted it and figured out what your model looks like, which you know, not, not a sort of USL model, whatever model you've landed on that fits those data, the question now is, are you prepared to put the crown jewels on the table, the sort of data that's hanging from the ceiling, and commit yourself to projecting that that data is going to look like what that model says in the future, not now, in the future. That's the real game. And that's what I'm doing here. Now, it could turn out that uh, if you went back and did measurements out to say 3,000 generators, for example, maybe the thing actually plateaus up or something. There's nothing wrong with that. But that says, well, the USL didn't know that that was going to happen. That's something new information has come into the data that wasn't available before. So it's still consistent. It's not that all the model broken or the model's wrong. It says the model is correct with the information it had at the time. And now you're bringing new information, and you can remodel that data. And if it actually plateaus off or something like that, then we would see that, and the USL will model that effect because it's now containing the data. Here's another example, a more recent one actually. This is a Linux uh, network driver. And uh, once again, what I'm doing here is, that I actually just saw this on Twitter. I tend to live on Twitter. I see so many interesting things on Twitter. You know, I don't follow Kim Kardashian, but I do follow some other people who do some reasonably interesting things. And this guy actually is from Red Hat. And um, he goes to talk, he has a very nice set of slides. I don't know the guy, but I looked at his slides. And here it is, is his data. And he's making some comparisons for, um, uh, millions of packets per second, the network kind of throughput metric. 
uh, against the number of cores on this Linux box, so up through six apparently. And here's his data, and I see, well, yes, that looks kind of, you know, a concave type of function. I wonder what the USL would think of that. So let's try it out. So I go ahead and do that, and uh, you can see I've actually got three curves here now that I've done them at the same time. And you can see, for example, this set of data is represented by the squares, kind of is linear up to a point where it then plateaus out at 80 million packets per second or whatever. And that's, I claim, is consistent with his data. You see the data don't sit right on the line, but that's exactly what you expect for regression. You shouldn't have the data lying right on the line, that would be wrong. So statistically speaking, taking into account you know, variations in the data, that actually is quite a reasonable fit there. That orange line is a good representation of his data. Actually, if I was talking to him, I would say, I'd like to know why those data could, uh, are where they are. Could they mean they need to be a bit closer to the uh, USL curve, the orange curve? That might be something that he, he would go away and look at. And then we both learn something new. Uh, the, uh, the circles represented by the green curve, and you see that actually that, that scales at a throughput that's even higher than what he measured according to this prediction, because I'm I'm now projecting out to 20 cores, which he doesn't have, so that wasn't on his test group. In the case of the, the triangular data, that looks like that has a, a, a maximum, and then it starts to roll off slightly. So which of these is the best one? I suppose that depends what you're doing. I think he was focused on this linear rising one, because that looks like, as I said earlier, that's what everybody expects. That's not necessarily the best case. The best case could be something that grows more moderately. It depends on the circumstances. And all performance is about trade-offs, so it depends what those trade-offs are. So that would be an interesting discussion to have if I knew the guy. Actually, I put this back on Twitter and he responded to it, so we had a little conversation. This is another example uh, that I presented actually at the Velocity Conference back in 2010. And this is to do with Memcache. Memcache is this uh, basically a uh, uh, key value uh, uh, memory. Um, and the idea is to get around scale up and start to scale out, as to say, uh, do things in a more distributed way. That's, the, that's what everybody thinks about now as more distributed types of architecture. So this is a scale out kind of approach using memcache. Basically, you put memcache in front of a database, you read in a bunch of key data pairs, which are then read out of memcache rather than making individual accesses into the database. That's basically what it's doing. And, but more importantly, the idea is that um, you can uh, put the memcache uh, front end onto some cheap uh, hardware. For example, just single CPUs at some point back when we were discussing this in 2010. The current generation of cheap machines, old machines, legacy machines would have been single CPUs more or less on a, per board or something like that. Now, of course, we have multi-core. Since 2005, we have multi-core. But the idea is that uh, you would put memcache on, if you're going to put it on a multi-core box, ultimately as you roll the hardware, you'd like to be able to make use of all of those cores. Well, it turns out memcache doesn't scale that way. And my co-authors actually looked at this and made, provided these measurements, and here are the data. So what we're looking at here is the number of so-called worker threads in, in memcache, ranging between one and 12 threads. And you can see already just from the data, there's not much point in going higher than that because the thing peaks out around about a half a dozen threads. If you add more threads, then the throughput starts to drop. And that's what's shown on the y-axis in terms of the number of thousands of operations per second. So basically, uh, read the data in, and now I'm going to do some processing in R, which is how I typically do these things. And just, just to show you, this is what the code looks like in R. The thing that's doing the work is this function called NLS in R. And it's basically the non-linear non least squares function. What's very nice about that is you can just put the equation, I think you can see the USL equation there, if you look carefully in the first line. And um, you can tune it in a certain parameter space where you're looking for the alpha, beta, gamma values, and boom, it calculates all this in one shot. And then I can just fit that curve to the data immediately. So it's very, very powerful, and very nice to use. So this is what it looks like. This is actually three data sets combined. And I'm doing the USL fit, the nonlinear regression fit to all three of those data. And now you see I've recovered the alpha, beta, and gamma values. 
And the alpha value says that basically this is serialized to the tune of about 4.6% of the time it's doing something serialized, means it's contending for resources of some type. Now, as a performance analyst, I have no idea what it's contending for, and frankly, I don't really care. But I know it's doing it. It's up to the, that's up to the developers or the Ben Cash experts to tell me what it's actually doing. I, after all, I didn't write the software, how, why should I know? So while they're figuring out why it's serialized, you know, almost 5% of the time, I'm going home to watch TV. And then when we come back the next day, we'll have a discussion, they'll tell me what the conclusion of their results is, and then we'll get the rest. Uh, the, beta, the beta term is actually very small, but it's not zero. And since it's not zero, we do see it rolling off. And uh, I look at this now a little bit more carefully. So the uh, gamma value is just the linear portion. That's to say the rate at which it rises linearly. So that's the lower left part of the uh, plot on the left-hand side. And that's actually also an estimate of the throughput if I just had one worker thread running in Memcache. The contention parameter one I just mentioned is about 4.6% of the time it's actually serialized, contending for resources of some kind. And it turns out, if you take the uh, throughput number with just one thread and divide that by that parameter alpha, it will tell you where that ceiling is, the horizontal ceiling, the limit, and that turns out to be just under 2,000 kilos per second. So these I'm getting now from the model. You wouldn't have gotten that just from the data. And then the, uh, the uh, beta parameter that I just mentioned, this so-called coherency parameter, uh, has to do with the amount of time spent exchanging distributed data. A simple example would be caches. When caches become inconsistent in a distributed system, and somebody wants to do an update or a write to a cache, but they don't have the current value, they have a stale value, then they have to get the current value from the other cache, whoever has the most, the most recent value of this kind of thing. So this, it's all possible permutations of that give you the, uh, this beta parameter. That's what it's actually covering. So beta, to me, very simply put, is to do with data exchange. So this says roughly about 2% of the time, it's involved with some kind of data exchange, even though that's not the way people normally think about how the memcache works. And the peak, you can see here, occurs at 6.7 threads. That's the numerical estimate based on regression. This information was actually used by some people at Sun Microsystems just at about the time they were being purchased by Oracle uh, to make some changes inside Apache memcache code to help it to scale out on Spark processes in particular. So I'm just showing you some results here of the scalability improvements that can be made. And with each change in, in the uh, software, new load test measurements are performed. And then we can do a fit to the uh, USL model. And when I arrive at these kind of curves, and I'm just showing a summary of the improvements that they made from one release to another. There's three releases here. And you can see that the peak is both increasing getting higher, but it's also moving to the right. So it means that rather than being limited to being most efficient at about six threads, it's now most efficient at about something like 45 threads. So that's a considerable improvement. And that means that when you roll the hardware to have a large number of multi-cores, then you're actually going to be able to make use of them because you'll be able to run that many uh, worker threads uh, simultaneously. So this is something that Sun actually accomplished, but for Spark only, as far as I know. What's happened since then, I'm not sure. OK. Um, next example. Uh, you may have read about Apache Zookeeper. There's another uh, similar uh, uh, type of application uh, that Comcast uses called Sirius. And I happen to know some people at Comcast, so they provide me some uh, data for, for Sirius as opposed to, to Zookeeper, but the same kind of idea. The basic idea is coordinating distributed uh, applications through a kind of a voting system. So here we have the data. In fact, uh, I remember when uh, Comcast people first showed me this data, I couldn't understand why they were showing it to me because you can see uh, it starts here at about the cluster size. This is a set cluster, physical cluster actually. So with three nodes, you can see that it's doing about 1,500 writes per second or something in that order. But then as you add more nodes, the throughput deteriorates quite markedly. 
So why are you showing me this? This is not interesting. This is not my idea of scaling. So I thought this was completely crazy when I first saw it. But later on, I understood the point. So if we actually apply the USL to this now, so the same procedure I showed you before, and I'm doing this once again now, uh, here you see something new. So there's the original data. The blue curve is the USL curve that fits those data. But in addition, now I'm showing you the, the dotted line to the left, which doesn't exist in the data. And I'm also showing you uh, the throughput if you just had one node. Now actually, that makes no sense, because remember, it's kind of a voting system. So you need at least three servers to reach a majority. That's why it starts at three. On the other hand, the USL can tell you what it would be like for one, which is not how it works, but that might be interesting information for some other reason. So the black square there is something that's coming out of the model that you can't see in the data, which may have other uses. Um, and the reason, of course, it all goes downhill is because you add more nodes, and it's going to take much longer to reach a, a final majority resolution of, uh, you know, how things should be configured and so forth. So actually, this is exactly how the thing is supposed to work. So once again, just looking at those numbers, gamma gives me the, uh, the, uh, the linear rising portion, because that's not really relevant here. So it turns out that that gamma really was, uh, corresponds to that black square. It tells me the throughput with a single thread, which is about 1,000 rights per second. It's roughly right. Looking now at the contention parameter, that's at about 5%. So 5% of the time, it's contending for resources, while probably trying to sort out the, who's got the majority in this kind. So that kind of makes sense. And they also uh, uh, can put a ceiling on it and so on and so forth. That's at about 20, 21,000 writes per second if you could ever get there. And then finally, uh, looking at the coherency parameter, the beta parameter, uh, that's responsible for the retrograde behavior. Of course, that's all you ever see in the data is just totally retrograde behavior because that's actually the way it works. So what looks shocking to me originally actually now makes complete sense once I'm analyzed in terms of the USL. Is there a question? Yeah, so is there a business goal be to uh, reduce the retrograde? Uh, so the question is, would, would the point be to reduce the retrograde behavior? Uh, you want to scale the cluster out, you want to go down. Uh, I understand. Uh, the answer is, so it depends what you're trying to do. But what I What I would say here, because you're echoing my original surprise, actually. Uh, what I would say here is this is the way the thing works. So every time you add more nodes, the throughput is going to degrade. Not because of a bad thing, it's because that's the way it works. If you, you have to have more coordination between more things, it's going to take longer, that's going to pull your throughput down. And that stands to reason. So I think the first answer to, that, to your question would be no, not in this particular case. On the other hand, if it was another system, that would probably be your first uh, choice, would be to try to make, make that beta parameter zero, whatever it took to do that, and try to remove that retrograde behavior. So yes, in a, if that were, if it were another system, that would be the appropriate thing to do. In this particular system, it looks crazy. That's how it works. It's doing the best it can do. And you might be able to moderate it slightly, but because it would, when you add, add more clusters and you scale the system up, your throughput is guaranteed to go down just because of the way it works. You might ameliorate that a little bit, but it's, all, it's always going to decline in some sense. It's going to have that retrograde um, uh, uh, slope to, to the curve because you're adding, more, you're adding more nodes, and more nodes have to sort out who's got the majority. Yeah. So, are you saying that this system is non-scalable by design? It's, well, it's what you mean by scalableness yeah. in this case. I mean, it, 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 it's doing what it's supposed to do, and it's probably doing about as good as it can do under the circumstances for the work that it's trying to execute. That's why I say it's shocking but true. It is not, not what you expect, not what I expect. In fact, when they were telling me about the original, I didn't understand why we had this conversation. It's why are you showing me this rubbish? I mean, what's the point? But I didn't understand how the thing worked. Once I understood how the thing works, then this makes perfect sense. That's why I'm showing you. It's such an unusual system. And yes, this is actually pretty good performance under the circumstances for this particular design. Uh, uh, I, I assume that they want to add more nodes for other reasons, like redundancy or something. No, like. that may well be, yeah. and uh, that's not factored in here. That's right. That could, that could also be. Yeah. That would be my question. 
Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I mean, you, put, you would want to add more nodes for other reasons, such as having high reliability or redundancy of this kind of thing. That's absolutely right, yeah. And uh, these are all trade-offs. And um, But you might put that together in such a way that you don't impact the current retrograde throughput. You wouldn't want that to get any worse, hopefully. So uh, yeah, all these other things come into play, and they're all part of the uh, trade-offs that you have to make. Um, and I'm just showing you basically what they showed me, which was just the performance for this particular cluster, which I already thought was dramatic enough. So, yeah. All right, uh, final uh, example is uh, something running on the uh, AWS Cloud application, something I just did uh, this year actually, or finished up this year. And um, by the way, if, if you do get a copy of my slides, all these blue Blue text is links that you can click on the links and go to other, other sources of information. There's a lot of stuff contained in these slides if you, if you take a look at them. Um, so the reason I'm showing this example is this is a production data net. We're not doing load testing. This is actually coming off a live system. The live system, I can't go into too much detail because there's a lot of proprietary information, but basically it's a Tomcat application, Apache Tomcat application running uh, not on local infrastructure, but running an AWS cloud. And it's a mobile application, so it's taking some requests from people out on the internet, or connected by Wi-Fi, or through a cell phone network, making requests to this system on AWS. That system then talks to additional third-party uh, websites or uh, applications, and then it encapsulates and returns that response to the mobile users. That's basically what it's doing. I'll show, you, I'll show you the uh, architecture in a second. Uh, but basically, what I wanted to emphasize here was the difference between the, the load testing system, the load testing platform, and this production system, because um, getting data off the production system can be very difficult. One thing that really helped it here was it's a Java-based application, so you can use something like JMX interface, the whole bunch of tools that work with that kind of thing, and that helps a lot. So. Uh, we used a combination of JMX and some Linux operating system metrics and so on and so forth. I don't go into all of that detail here. Um, but what I'm trying to show here in this table is uh, to separate out the metrics that are kind of raw, the, the raw data metrics on the left hand side of the table, so the things like elapsed time for which we're measuring data, that's important to know. Uh, the amount of time the thing spends processing, for some definition of processing. The amount of completed work that could be counted. These are things that can be counted inside the JVM that can then get exported through the JMX interface and so on. And then Linux can provide information about the things like CPU utilization. So let's take the left hand side as kind of like raw data elements. Now that's not really sufficient for applying the USL because we need to go for, uh, to another step, which is to convert that raw data information into metrics which we derive from that raw data. Now, that sounds sophisticated, but all I'm going to be talking about is that we have to define such things as throughput. So, for example, the thing that I'll be calling x, the throughput, my symbol for throughput earlier, is the number of completions during the measurement period. So it would be c over t. So I'll go and find the c numbers and the t numbers, form that ratio, and boom, now I've got my throughput number, which I'm now going to use for the USL. Uh, similarly, I can do things to calculate response times, the number of concurrent threads, I can use Little's law, this kind of thing. And the, uh, I can also use the CPU realization and the throughput number that I'm deriving to calculate things like the service time, which can also be very, very useful. So I've got the raw data, and then I've got derived metrics. And the derived metrics take me now towards the model. Once I've got my derived metrics in, in good shape, then I can apply the USL model to analyze them. So what you're seeing here in the bottom of this slide is uh, essentially a set of timestamp data. And it's, there's X, the throughput, N, level of concurrency, number of concurrent threads running. S is the service time, determined through the CPU utilization. R is the response time, and so on. So it turns out, out of all the possible raw data elements that you could have gotten from Linux, and from JMX, and from CloudWatch on AWS, this is gargantuan. You know, maybe a thousand metrics or something you could get. All I need is these uh, half dozen. Remember I said in the beginning, it's what you, you have to try to figure out what you can throw away, not, not what you have to put in the blue. Now, if we do all that, 
And I plot this out as just those data elements. I'm plotting now the number of Tomcat thread, threads in that we've gotten from our production data. So you can't measure in directly, but when I measure the throughput and the response time will derive those two numbers, I take the product of those two numbers, that will give me n. And that's Little's law, and Little's law is immutable. That comes from God. So if the data doesn't agree with that, the measurement process is broken. So anyway, this, uh, this is the plot now of uh, these Tomcat threads, which we didn't know how many there were before, but now I do know, and there's something like between, let's say, 100 and 500. I can see that immediately, just reading off the x-axis. And there on the y-axis is the corresponding throughput request per second. Now there's a cloud of data, if I can use that term. The cloud and the cloud, this is the AWS cloud. So now we have to start to think about how, we, how to analyze these data, and I'll just show you where we end up fairly early on. So this is a USL model of those data, and this actually looks pretty good because I can see I've got my linear bound on the left, that's that uh, sloping red line. I've got my ceiling there, and I can see the blue curve, which is the USL data, the USL model rather, right? goes through those, that data cloud in some average sense, as it should do for, for nonlinear regression. And it's calculating for me the alpha, beta, gamma coefficients in that equation, which I'll get out of the R calculations. So this actually looks quite good, and I also know that every throughput curve should be concave. This is a concave function, so that's good. It all looks very consistent. And I can draw no conclusions from all this. So for example, the concurrency parameter is three, so this says actually if there was only one request in the system, it would be producing about three requests per, sec per second throughput value, which is not in the data, but I can calculate it from the USL model. Um, the smallest number of threads that we saw actually in those data was about 100, something that would work. it never gets below that, because in the 24 hour cycle over all the time zones around the world, there's always some activity going on much bigger than one. So that also uh, makes, makes sense. If I look at the contention parameter, that's zero. That's interesting. That says, in principle, I would expect that not to fall away from linear. And because there's no, there's no waiting, there's no waiting for other resources, there's no sharing of resources, there's no contention for resources. On the other hand, you can see that it's a concave function, so something else must be pulling it away from linear. Well, that turns out to be this beta coefficient. So you, you can have alpha zero, no contention, but you can have beta non-zero, this is a coherency parameter, so there's some kind of data exchange going on between these threads, apparently. But it's a pretty small number. It's just enough to make the thing start to curve away from linear. But 10 to the minus 6 is a very, very small number. So uh, there's really very little data exchange, but some kind of data exchange. And from that, I can calculate the peaks and so on and so forth. So this looks quite good. Now, it turns out that when we looked at this more closely, uh, we ran into some issues, which I don't have time to go into to know. But basically, here's a, here's a drawing of the architecture. So you have your internet users at the top of the diagram, your mobile users. There's a load balancer, uh, front-ending the uh, uh, Amazon cloud. And then we have these EC2 instances, the Amazon uh, EC2 instances, which you spin up, basically virtualized um, processing. And then they talk to these external services or third parties that do other things and provide other information, and that gets returned to the mobile user. So one of the things that was a little bit puzzling was that in, in the analysis that, we, that I just showed you, you see this gradual fall away from linear, which I can now identify with beta, not alpha, but beta, interestingly enough. Uh, but that's already a little bit of a problem, because we know from the uh, architecture of the way Tomcat works, it really should be running parallel threads. That's to say they really shouldn't be interacting with each other. And if I throw more work into the system, each new request will get a new thread. If it gets a new thread, it will just be scaling linear. Because that's how it's supposed to work, if you read the manual, so to speak, or the data sheet, it's supposed to work like that. Because I am, I'm clueless when I get this information from the people I work with. So that seemed a little bit odd. Um, we also know there's no contention. And we also know that, in some sense, the thing sort of plateaus out up here, which, which we sort of understand, but it's not completely uh, transparent what's going on there. And uh, there's another issue, and that is that the CPU, if you look at CPU utilization numbers, they never get above 75%, even if you go out to 500 requests, uh, 500 uh, uh, Tomcat threads. 
it never gets, it never gets above 75%. So when we thought about this a little bit more, it turns out that uh, we are sort of overlooked something. And that is that AWS provides something called Auto Scanning. Anybody here use Auto Scanning on AWS? No? So Auto Scanning is a way of uh, pr provisioning resources dynamically by scaling up as the demand increases, as the total traffic coming into the system increases. And that's just accomplished by spinning up the ends. Now the, the, or EC2 instances in the case of the AWS cloud. So the way this works is you have to provide some kind of policy that's going to trigger the scale up, the order scaling. It turns out the policy is if the instance you're looking at gets to the point where the CPU is running at 75% busier or higher, start spinning up other instances and redistribute the load such that that instance never runs higher than 75% busier. Get the idea? Well, we overlooked that in the previous model. But this is very interesting because one thing I can tell you immediately is Linux can't do that. Linux will, it's just a time shift schedule, it will start to keep putting stuff on the CPU until it's running 100% busy, at which point the system is saturated. So Linux can't do something like, oh, by the way, if you're 75% busy, we'll, we'll uh, shift the load somewhere else. Linux can't do that. So that raises a question, who's doing it? I'll let you think about that for a minute. So when we did that, and I go back and reanalyze the data, it turns out to be like this. So here we have linear rising through, but that's to say parallel threads, which is what Tomcat does. And then it rises to a point where it looks like it saturates. But the saturates it means your throughput can't get any higher because if it was normal saturation, the CPU would be running 100% busy. There's no more capacity left. So if, even though you put more load in the system, no more throughput can be attained. On the other hand, remember that the CPU is running 75% busy. That's not coming from Linux, it's coming from this AWS order scale in some way. So this is kind of what I would call pseudo, pseudo saturation. And you can see the pseudo saturation there. And if I take it into account, then I can refit the USL model and produce the blue curve you see here. The interesting part is there's a discontinuity here because it goes from linear rising to this horizontal plateau. But that's exactly the point where the order scanning kicks in. And it happens to correspond to, and the USL will calculate what it is, it happens to correspond to 247.8, sorry, 274.8, or 275 threads. At around about 275 threads, apparently that corresponds to the CPU at 75% busy, order scanning kicks in, load gets redistributed, and now you're through for plateaus on any instance. And uh, it doesn't matter what instance you're, we're only looking at one instance here, but the point is uh, all the instances should be doing the same thing, because if they're not, something's wrong. The load balancer wouldn't be working correctly, right? Okay, uh, this is my last example, I think. So I thought I'd, I better have some big data when I get popped in case there's a lot of big data scientists here tonight. So this is, um, some work that I did with some people um, a couple of years ago where we had something like 2,000 production database logs, 500,000 data points. And if you just start plotting some of those out, and, you know, this is just a small subset. How do you comprehend all this stuff? I mean, this is a lot of, even if you do them as, as separate plots, it's a lot, of, a lot of work to try and comprehend analytically. So the answer is, let's see if this works. The idea I came up with was to create a movie. And of course, we'll see if the movie. It might be unstable, but it still works. That's tricky. So the idea is I go through all of these instances, I, I plot the data based on all the data points I have, and I just go through them. This is one, this is once a second. And I can see immediately visually what it look like good candidates for further analysis or not. So I think animation is your friend when it comes to things like this. All right, so when you do that, then uh, you, I can do a similar kind of analysis with the USL that I just showed you for the AWS. So we have a cloud of data points, and we can make comparisons, and here are some of the numbers. And I won't go into this in, in, in any kind of detail, but this tells you a lot about different kinds of production systems running MySQL in different kinds of environments. These all represent all different customers that we're using 
uh, MySQL database. So what, what transpired, it's a little, a little bit too complicated to go into tonight, but there's some very interesting, subtle, progressive scalability changes that we saw across different releases of MySQL and so on. And these were all picked up by the USL analysis. If you were just looking at the data, you'd never have figured it out. But when you can uh, superimpose the USL model on top of the data, provide that as an additional framework, then all of these things become revealed to you. So, uh, just to finish off, there's uh, uh, some enterprising people who've come to my classes who've gone off and produced packages in R that actually do quite sophisticated stuff with the USL. Um, and these are a couple of them. Uh, one of them's another one on CRAN, uh, the one's on uh, Forge. And uh, they do like automatic comparisons between different kinds of scalability and parameters, adjust them for sensitivity and so on and so forth, which I would normally just do manually myself. But uh, you were doing a lot of these things um, across production data, as I've just been showing you, then this might be a, a way to go. Uh, the last thing is that tonight I've talked about throughput scalability, all the functions you've seen as concave functions. That's, in my view, the easiest way to understand scalability. Actually. But we could also ask questions about response time scalability, and I haven't shown you that tonight. It is completely impossible to do that. And um, the connection is that you take your throughput uh, function that I've been showing you tonight with the alpha beta gamma coefficients in. Once you get that organized, then there's a corresponding response time equation, which is actually based on Turing theory. And it connects uh, the, the throughput value with your thread level or whatever. And this other thing, Z, is actually what's called the think time in queuing theory. It's the delay between resubmitting transactions. Um, with that information, you can then calculate the corresponding response time. But rather than going into all of that, uh, which we don't have time for tonight, I'll just show you diagrammatically how this looks. Um, if we just take pure response time corresponding to pure parallel, that's to say ideal linear scanning, that everybody likes to imagine they can have, then the corresponding response time looks like this. So that as you add more processes or more processes, your response time comes down per, per process. Um, it turns out that if there's a threshold which you can't get below, that actually corresponds to Amdahl's law. Of course, I don't have time to show you that tonight. That's actually quite, quite interesting. So there's a, there's a lower bound which is higher than what you'd expect from pure parallel. And that actually turns out to correspond to Umbel's law. And then this one is uh, interesting. How many people here know about Brooks, Brooks Law? You have heard Brooks Law? Brooks Law basically is um, it was developed by Fred Brooks at IBM, but basically the way I think about it, it's a, it's a representation in software development of too many cooks in the kitchen. Too many cooks spoil the broth, you know that, that old adage. So what, the idea is that if you have a project, a software project that you're trying to develop to a certain schedule, if you're running late, the usual reflex action is to try and get more people involved to get it done faster. And that may work up to a point, but then you will reach another point of diminishing returns such that the delivery time now starts to extend on you because you've got too many people involved trying to communicate with one another. That additional latency expands the schedule. And you can see that because the response time curve has now, has now uh, gone convex, it's now kicking up as, as I add more processes or more people to the project. And then if I take that particular graph uh, for, that corresponds to Brooks' law and just apply this, you can see that basically this is an inverse relationship. You take the response time, the relationship between the throughput and the response time is an inverse kind of function. So it flips upside down. And you can see if I take Brooks' law and flip it upside down, I get exactly the USL uh, uh, concave function I've shown you earlier. So it's all, it's, it's all there. It's kind of cool, actually. So I'll finish up there if there's any additional questions. Is, is there any kind of system architecture which, which would uh, invalidate the USL model? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Is there any kind of system with a the USL? What, what sort of thing would Well, um, you know, some kind of system architecture in which the USL model would not apply in terms of the, the curves. Like, I don't know, it, 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 you know, it degrades, and then, and then there's some more complex shape. Yes, okay, I understand your question. So, yeah, but in other words, could the USL curve have a more, comp a more complex shape? And the way I would um, reinterpret that is, what you're asking is, 
What would happen if we added more terms in the denominator with the USL? Because it stops at the quadratic term, you noticed. Yeah, yeah. And I declared it to be universal, which we can argue about, okay? But I thought about this a lot before I stuck my neck out. So I stopped at the quadratic term because we've already gone through some kind of peak. And as my colleagues over here pointed out, you know, really, once that happens, you'd really like to get rid of that. You don't want to see in all the gory detail how bad is it, like is it really going out to a, a fifth power polynomial or something like that, right? You could do that, and by the way, now that you just reminded me of something, I had a student in one of my classes quite a few years ago now who got totally revved up about this stuff and went away and he had some very, very um, specialised kinds of tools that did sort of more tracing type of analysis and he, you know, ad nauseum went into all of this and Suddenly, I got this email, and some months later, I got this email from him saying he found a correction to the USL, which is exactly the question. And I thought, uh oh, you know, I've met my world blue, maybe. So I examined what he'd done, and it's more or less what you were just showing. So you know, you've got this concave rising up to a peak, and then starts to diminish, but rather than diminishing the way that I showed you, it was very sudden, almost like dropping off a cliff, and crashed, almost crashed into the x-axis, and then went flat, something like that. Yeah. And he had, he had determined that this matched something like a fifth order polynomial or something like in the denominator. And that's when I realized it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, that's very interesting for a mathematician. We're not doing math. We're trying to do performance analysis, and as these gentlemen pointed out, you know, even reaching the peak there, where you start to have uh, retrograde throughput, that's a real problem. And you really want to get rid of that peak if you can, and therefore, you know, any fancy effects that are going on higher than that are really academic. It's like you're in a plane, the wings just fell off, and now we're going to have an academic, academic discussion about how we're going to crash into the ground, and it's not particularly productive. So that was kind of my conclusion, but you reminded me about that. But it's a very, it's a very good question, it's a very important question, and um, one that I felt compelled to address. But it, it turned out it, it arose because of something a student went off and did in his enthusiasm. And I thought that's great, you know, but then when I looked a little bit more closely, I thought, well, wait a minute, I, I, that's actually very useful. Very interesting, but I don't know if it's very useful. So that's kind of my position, I think. That's, that's roughly speaking how I ended up calling it universal finally, because it's like I don't need more than those three terms in the denominator. That really does cover everything up to essentially what would normally be bad performance, although we saw with, uh, with Zootkeeper and Sirius, what looks like horrible performance is actually the way the damn thing works. So, once you understand the context, that also makes sense, strangely enough. Otherwise, I would have, my original position on it is why are we even discussing this? Get rid of that peak, get rid of that stupid retrograde performance, and then we'll talk about fitting the USL. But that wasn't the point, because that's not how it works. So it very much depends on the context of what's going on. But yeah, it's a very good question. And yes, I've thought about that a lot, and I still think it's universal. Three, co three coefficients in that. By the way, uh, just, just add to that now that I think about it, the gamma coefficient you see there, that's actually a very recent addition, only in the last year. I used to only originally have two. If you look at my book, I only talk about two parameters. And the other thing I forgot to stress tonight is that that USL formula I claim is completely physical. That's another, another argument that I have, is that unlike normal, if you're just doing data science, you know, or statistics, the model could be, you know, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 with all the coefficients, some multivariate model, whatever you like, including your grandmother's age, you can just toss it in there and see if it means anything. That's not the way this works. The, I've limited it to those three coefficients, or originally two coefficients, because they have a physical representation. That's how I can say to developers, your alpha coefficient is such and such, and that means you are contending for resources, probably in a message queue or something like that. Does this ring a bell for you? And amazingly, the light bulb often goes off. Not necessarily initially, but at some point. Uh, I can also say the beta term. That's to do with data exchange, pairwise exchange. That's why it's quadratic. Are you doing some kind of cache coherency type of effect? That's what's contributing to that value. And it turns out, even though I'm utterly clueless as to what's really going on, and I'm quite happy to remain that way, they will go away and, and they will then interpret for me what that actually means in the actual software system. Now, um, up until about a year ago, I only had the two parameters, alpha and beta. The gamma came in because originally what I thought you had to do was to normalize the data to, to get the C value, the C of N value, and all that stuff. And it turns out that actually, <laughs> Because I think of this stuff so physically, or I guess it's my theory of physics background, I think of this stuff so physically, I completely overlook 
the fact, somewhat to my embarrassment, that if you're going to use it as a regression model, then why not go whole hog? Well, my, my reluctance to do that was based on von, von Neumann's uh, quip about, you know, give me four parameters and I'll, uh, I'll fit an elephant. Give me five, I'll make this truck with them. So I had that in my mind. It's like, I don't want to add any more coefficients because that just you know, it's relaxing the constraints too much. But it turns out that relaxing at least one more to have, have that gamma coefficient makes it much easier to do the regression analysis. Just relax, and then you don't have to do all the normalization procedure, which was a bit of monkey business anyway. And I completely overlooked that because I was, I mean, I think, although I was doing regression analysis to get the alpha and beta values, that was, I wasn't thinking of that way. I was thinking very physically, and therefore I didn't want to add any more coefficients because of what Von Neumann would say. But then I realized, well, then yes, if you do that, you know, you idiot. Why not just do the whole thing as regression, put that parameter, and then you don't have to do any normalization, and now it makes it extremely easy to use. Well, I say easy, you have to, you have to tweak it. It's very sensitive, it's more sensitive, but it's easier to do, uh, you know, uh, in terms of how you do the analysis, and easier to understand in some sense. So all that normalization monkey business kind of goes away now, which is actually a good thing. So three is, three is okay. See, well, one of them said four, so I'm still under the threshold. So yeah, maybe at the back there. Would this model apply to like supercomputers modeling climate, complex models like climate? Like that? Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I, I, I took, I'm sorry, with this, um, for the USL be used for things like supercomputer uh, applications that model things like climate modeling or whatever. Um, I actually took a slide out tonight, which I sometimes put in, and uh, now I regret it, because it's an interesting question that you asked. I had a slide which shows um, uh, a curve for, for, for dark matter. That's to say, you look at a galaxy, you know, the, the, like spiral galaxy, like the Milky Way or Andromeda, and the thing is basically rotating. You can't see it rotating, but it is rotating about the galactic center. And the thing about dark matter is that um, if you apply Newton's laws to this rotation of the stars around the galactic center, it doesn't work. And the funny thing is that the curve that corresponds to the rotational velocity, radial velocity going away from the galactic center, looks exactly like the USL curve. All right? And then what you do observe when you, when you actually measure the actual rotation values you see a curve that goes up like this and plateaus out, which is like the Andon case. So it's like the beta's gone to zero. And you know, you have to wonder, I mean, if I had more time or if somebody paid me more money, maybe I should go and try to apply that actually to looking at something like dark matter. Obviously, the interpretation would be all completely different. But it just makes you wonder whether, you know, when I say universal, I was half kidding. I wasn't thinking that serious about it. But maybe, you know, it would be interesting to investigate that. So there's an example. That's a little bit different from your question. I'm sorry. But it's going to remind me of that, that slide I sometimes put in. The, it, the reason I put it in there is because don't just, you shouldn't just be thinking about the data that you see day to day. Sometimes there are other data, other circumstances where that same model might be applicable, but you would never have thought of it before, which is, which is kind of the answer to your question. But I mean, with regard to the supercomputer stuff, I mean, it's, it's, um, it, it's, you know, what, it's just running an application. You know, it might be a complicated application. It's just running an application, and it may be running on a lot of processors. Uh, but yes, the USL can model it. By the way, now that I think about it, you remind me of something. Tonight, I focused on N representing process ease threads, for example. Right? The same model can be applied to hardware. So if you're trying to scale up you know, a supercomputer to figure out how many cores to put in, where's the maximum throughput and all that sort of thing, it's the same model. Just that n now becomes the number of physical process ors as opposed to processes. You see what I'm saying? Same model, slightly different interpretation of the of the variables, but the same same model. So uh, you know, my my answer is yes. And uh, if you if you think you have something that uh, challenges that idea, I'd love to see it too. By the way, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to apply. I haven't applied that to a super good example like I can think of, but it surely could work. Yes. So, um, how does this compare to the, the recent developments in deep learning and whatnot, right? How can you think about it? So, this is very elegant, you know. Thank you. Uh, 
so much data, but how does it compare? So how does this compare with deep learning strategies? Man, that's a lot. We can have a separate talk about that. Um, I'm not an expert on that stuff, but uh, you know. So I guess my position is, you know, it goes back to what one of was saying. The trouble is worse than what one of was saying because it's like, don't even worry about parameters. I'll, I'll fit an elephant, make it track or whatever you want, just give me more data. The trouble is, I guess I kind of look at this from a point of view of physics. The trouble with that stuff is, uh, I don't want to sound too categorical about this because I'm not an expert on it. But the trouble with it is what bothers me about that is that nobody really knows what the models are. Um, and that's a problem. So thank you for calling this elegant. Look, I mean, one way that may appear elegant is that at least we know what the alpha, and beta, and gamma mean. And I just, I just said a minute ago, I'm not even doing it like normal regression. I'm being far more hardcore saying this model is it because it's, you know, it's universal, but also there are three, three parameters and I know exactly what those three parameters mean physically. I have a physical interpretation, which is not normally a requirement for statistical regression. Multivariate regression doesn't require that at all because multivariate regression isn't math. The stuff is written to look like equations, but it's not equations. It's to do with correlations or associations, not equations. Uh, and in, in a certain sense, um, deep learning and machine learning and so on and so forth are kind of, to me, souped up versions of that stuff. I mean, I know, I know how uh, um, uh, support vector machines work, for example. I know that part of it. And that is kind of a souped up regression analysis for, for doing classification. But the way it's done is taking deviations from the mean value line as well, except that instead of doing it vertically like I showed you tonight, it's done orthogonally. That's one of the changes that occurs in the equation, but it's really probably get crucified for saying it, but to me it's, it's like a souped up version of, of uh, regression analysis, number one. So it should be comprehensible, but then on the other hand, you know, when you use this uh, training data, lots of big, you know, big data, training data, uh, to try to try to get it to fit those data, but you don't know ultimately what the model is doing. Uh, I find that to be a real problem. The only thing I'm aware of is that people who tend to use deep learning or machine learning for image work. I think they have a better, can make a better fist of understanding what the models are doing. I don't think it's perfect and it's not like this, but it's closer, I think, from everything I've read. You know, and it, once again, I've made more time with people throw more money at me, but I would like to look at that to see if something, uh, you know, could be done about that or, or that could be done in a different way. It would be very interesting. Something over here, to, some, you have a question? gave an example uh, before uh, for this. Uh, we fit the data to uh, Kepler's uh, theory. Uh, so there was a model. Uh, oh, you mean what Gauss did? Sorry. Yeah, yeah I see. I was going to think you were talking about dark matter. Yeah, yeah, correct. Right. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Here, the question is what is the physics behind this yourself? Uh, oh. Can you basically prove uh, this model? by uh, tracking it to uh, some model beyond the uh, formula? Very good question. Uh, let me tell you a little story. So this is, the question is, you guys really have to get me to know, don't you? But I'm prepared. So uh, <laughs> it, it's kind of related to your question. It is. Can yeah. I, in some sense, prove the USL is like the real, the real deal? I mean, that's perhaps summarizing your question. Is there, another, is there another way to look at it? And made a very nice reference to Gauss. Thank you. I don't think I'm in that lead, but the idea that Gauss was able to use Kepler's law in combination with regression and so on and so forth. And that's how he got away with such a small amount of data. That's the secret source that he used. Um, in that vein, if you look at one of these links, I have these links here. So where it says queuing theory foundations and queuing simulations, there's the proofs. And what I'll, so I'll put it this way. Um, I don't have time tonight to get into this, obviously, but. Um, the story I wanted to tell you was uh, uh, quite a few years ago, there was a supercomputer conference, some of you don't know about that, and um, in, well, there was actually a couple of them. In one supercomputer conference, which is actually what inspired me, a professor from MIT submitted a paper with the title something along the lines of, Amdahl's law is just a law, it should be repealed. <laughs> and the abstract more or less said, Amdahl's law, 
don't take it so seriously. It's just an ad hoc thing. Now, the reason he's saying it is because, you know, you may correct me if I you don't agree with this, but my, my uh, impression is that supercomputer people don't like the idea that things don't scale linearly. Maybe it does, but let's not talk about it too much. And the problem is that uh, the whole of the 1980s, by the way, was spent the DOD throwing money at parallel systems. And they didn't get the bang for the buck they were expecting, so they turned the spigot off. And companies like Thinking Machines and uh, other companies crashed and burned as soon as that happened. Okay, So that's the actual real story behind that. But is it what he was... To, sorry? It was Tuffins, uh, like you're talking about. What is Tuffins? Was Tuffin? No. I'm not as David, sorry. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Um, so uh, the reason that this MIT professor was submitting this paper was, you know, relax guys. If things are can be made pretty linear, don't worry about Amdahl's law, because Amdahl's law goes off like this, it goes and falls away from linear. That's the whole point of Amdahl's law, because you're serialized. Nobody wants to talk about that. And his point was, it's just an ad hoc statement. Don't take it so seriously. It should be repealed. It's not a real even the real law. And that's what inspired me. And then I looked at this more closely, and uh, the Queuing foundational stuff, the, the answer to your question, the reason I devised all that and explored all that was because I discovered that statement is completely wrong. Amnall's law, although it's not normally expressed or discussed in this context, uh, I proved in 2002 that Amnall's law actually is a consequence of certain kind of Queuing theory model. And in that sense, that would be my physical reference. That's my Kepler's law, as you like to think of that way. So I had a whole different framework, formal framework, based in Turing theory. And I could walk you through that and show you, see, if we do this and this and this and this and this, and I pull this rabbit out of the hat, and here's Arnold's law. And you say, what? We started with Turing theory with Arnold's law? And I'm saying, yes, here's the, here's the math of it. So it's, it, it works. And oh, by the way, we've also done simulations, but it, it works. And you may say that's rather unbelievable, and that's my whole point of doing it. But this says that our, even Arnold's law is completely rooted in the physical, as a physical consequence of Turing theory, which I'm taking as a completely bona fide framework and completely separate from anything I talk about tonight and not anything to do with regression analysis. <coughs> um, so, with that inspiration, another supercomputer conference came up, and I thought, well, this is fantastic. I'm going to the, the supercomputer people will definitely be interested in this because I can show them that our model all comes out of Turing theory. And indeed, in addition, by 2008, I was able to prove using the same kind of idea that the USL also comes out of similar kind of Turing theory, very much related. So I thought I'd submit this to a conference. There's a, there's a conference called Supercomputer, or SC, I think is the trade. It's a very big supercomputer conference. So I submitted this uh, paper to that conference, thinking, you know, this would be very interesting for these people. And uh, it had five referees, and every one of them canned which has never happened to me before, by the way. So I was absolutely nervous. I, mean, I couldn't believe what, and I was like, did anybody actually read this thing? Or did you get past the abstract? And one of the comments was, it's just coincidence. It's like, wait a minute, I've got a whole mathematical derivation, the appendix, and you're telling me this is coincidence. Anyway. One of the referees, so very smart, was a blind referee, right? But one of the referees put his email address in there. And I forget the exact wording now, but he said something along the lines is, I don't really buy it, but I would be prepared to discuss it with you. Which is incredibly unusual. It's kind of breaking the rules to a certain extent. And that's what happened. And I thought that's interesting, but I'm speechless and I don't know what to do because even if I went and talked to that guy, what am I going to tell him that I didn't already tell him in the paper? And if he didn't buy it there, you know, me yelling at him for half an hour isn't going to improve that problem. So I don't know what to do. I don't know how to answer a, a, a statement like that. It's coincidence. What do you tell? I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. About a year later, I had an idea, and the idea was, let's do a simulation of the Cumming system and show how it arises out of the Cumming system. I did that with a colleague of mine in Florida who just, you know, it's like throwing meat at a dog, you know, as soon as you said simulation, boom, he's off doing it. And he went and did the simulation. The first report he came back to me was, it doesn't work. I said, what do you mean it doesn't work? I said, I, I tried to produce Amnall's law like you told me, it doesn't work. I said, yeah, really? You've got the queuing system set up? Show me the code. So I looked at this code and I said, oh, I forgot to tell you something. 
you have to put a barrier synchronization in there somewhere or other. So put that in. Puts it in. And that led me to the whole idea that that might have been a way to discuss with that referee in a different vein, like what you're asking me. This would be a different formalism. And that might have missed because now we're here downstream and that's what the whole show is over, so that's a lost cause. But in that uh, uh, dram very dramatic, uh, you know, having my, my paper trashed by five referees, you know, unanimously, like that, was like, you know, give me a break, but even one person. Um, it was too late to, to satisfy them, but it did give me the idea that, that looking at the simulation would be a good way to approach this, and that's what it did. And then I've had uh, other people do that too, and it's all been reinforced. So I think I can say, on top of everything else I've said tonight, I can. If you look at that paper in the queuing simulations, or if you look in the queuing foundations link, you will see all of the details of how it's related to queuing theory. And I, I take that as my kind of my physical, my fundamental physical model, if you like. Yeah. So that's a, by the way, there's extremely interesting questions you're asking. I wasn't expecting this. I was expecting it was big data stuff, but it's not happening. So yes. All these graphs are part of any scan, that's the idea of the number of threads, right? Um, could we analyze it against, say, two things, like the number of threads and, say, the number of databases or number of hard drives? Could it be a multivariate model instead of a univariate model? So I understand the question. You're asking about a multivariate kind of model? Yes. So n is, say, the number of threads, right? That's correct, yes. That's the, that's the independent variable in this case. You are analyzing stuff against one independent variable. Could you do that? Oh, I, I see. OK. Well, uh, yes, yes, in a certain sense, yes. The answer, so he's asking me, let's see if I'm paraphrasing this correctly. Um, Rather than just showing the two-dimensional plots like I've been showing tonight, could you do, uh, on the x-axis, say, the, the independent variable still be the load in of some kind, okay? One y-axis might be throughput still, and then another one in another dimension, through a third dimension, another axis would be, I don't know what, you know, the number of cores or something like that. Yeah, that would be good. The number of physical cores. So that would be, just for those three, it would be a way of relating this software behavior that I've been talking about tonight to the hardware scalability of the system at the same time, simultaneously, which is sort of, I think, what you're asking, right? So the answer is yes, and then uh, I've done that. It's actually in my book, and what you produce then is the three-dimensional surface. Now, you could go on like that and extrapolate to many variables, multi-dimensional. Multi the trouble is you can't visualize that anymore. So that kind of breaks down. But as far as the analysis is concerned, that would be not a no-brainer, but it certainly could be done. Uh, the real challenge would be, can you understand what the models are telling you? So you could relate it to more metrics. I just think that in general, that's um, getting, about, getting about three. So like I described it, N, X, and say number of cores in the system or the number of nodes in the cluster, and showing that together produces a surface of some kind. And that I can understand. Like I can see with the minima on the surface and this kind of stuff. So the answer is yes. Going beyond that uh, would be a bit ambitious in my mind. I think. I'm not sure what you'd be getting out of it. But if you were just doing it from a numerical point of view, for example, a multivariate analysis, you know, you could have 50 terms in a multivariate equation, and then you're going to get 50 coefficients, and you're going to get all your R squared and F, F and P values and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's pretty mind boggling after a while, but you can do it. And numerically, it's not an issue. I mean, as far as you can do it in Excel. The real question is can you comprehend what it's telling you? So I have a little rule of thumb, I'll just point this out since you bring it up. My little rule of thumb is, um, when you're making comparisons, try to limit it to three things, similar to what I was just saying. But what I mean by that is, in principle, you should, even if you had, let's say, 50 metrics you wanted to compare, and you were thinking of doing that in a 50 dimensional plot, or 50 dimensional multilinear, uh, uh, sorry, multivariate analysis, suppose you wanted to do that, you could do that. But the trouble is, you have great difficulty in understanding what it's trying to tell you. And if you really look at it very closely, probably what you'll find is the following, which leads to my rule of thumb. My rule of thumb is, before you start doing all of that, think more carefully about what it is you are trying to understand. And see if you can pick out the two random variables or the two, the two metrics that you're really interested in. 
number one. And number two, the interaction of those two random variables. That's the second point. And then everything else put in the background. So therefore, you should never have more than three things you're looking at simultaneously. The two you're interested in, the pairwise comparison you're going to make, and the third thing is everything else. I mean, that's a, in, in any event, that's something we'd want to do to, to actually validate and check that you're understanding what the higher dimensional analysis would be telling you. Which, by the way, also goes back to that question about uh, you know, what, is, what, is, what is machine learning and deep learning. They, they have multi-dimensional uh, you know, uh, type of analysis, and that makes it also very difficult to understand what's really going on. And my, uh, my uh, uh, experience is, in general, uh, I get away with an awful lot with things like this. In, in some ways, I have no right to get away with this stuff. But the, but the fact of the matter is, when you really think about what's going on and you understand the real essence of the system, you never really need anything much more complicated. Because you've got an understanding that you wouldn't have otherwise had. And sometimes the model can lead you to a better understanding, such as, for example, the, uh, the series of zookeeper through could look completely weird to me. I couldn't understand why they were discussing this with me. But then ultimately, I came to understand, oh, that's how it actually works. And that's amazing. I mean, it looks crazy, but it's actually quite valid. And I would never have guessed that. So now I've learned something completely new out of that because I because I had to think about it and comprehend it. You understand what I'm saying? And it's that it's that work that people tend not to do because they just throw you know machine learning at it or you know to add more add more data sets or whatever without really trying to understand exactly what's going on. So my experience is that once you understand it, the simpler models tend to be much more revealing. Thank you very much for the talk.